Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this Autometrics webinar about BPVV treatment. We are excited to have participants from around the globe joining today. Before we'll start the presentation, I'll uh, give you a little information about uh, how we will run this webinar. So a few webinar tips and tricks. In order to reduce uh, background noise, we have muted all participants. You can ask questions at any time during the session using, using the question box in your webinar menu. Uh, all questions will be collected during the session and we will answer them at the end of the session or in case we don't have time to answer all questions, you will have an uh, email after the webinar with the answer. So here today with me uh, are Cameron Berin from uh, Ohio State University and uh, Wendy Cromley Welsh who is the product manager of ICS Impulse and the Balance Portfolio here at Autometrics. Um, and I'll leave the presentation for you, Cameron, to take on from here. Thank you, Anders. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, once again, this is the continuation uh, of the webinar that we had last time. Uh, the last webinar on, was on the assessment, and I will uh, just invite you to review that. It's a recorded webinar if you have not uh, uh, reviewed the assessment. In this uh, particular uh, presentation, we are going to talk about uh, treatment for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Just quick repeat of the uh, first two slides from the previous uh, webinar. As you know, BPPV is the most common cause of dizziness and balance problems. Uh, and fortunately, with the proper uh, assessment, uh, we can treat BPPV with simple uh, procedures. Um, this is the summary of what we talked about in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, the assessment protocols, the most effective assessment protocols for posterior canal uh, BPPV, which is the most common type of BPPV, and anterior canal BPPV, which is the least common type, uh, the assessment includes the best method would be the dix pike maneuver, and then an alternative would be the sideline maneuver. Uh, for lateral canal BPPV, the roll maneuver is the first step, and then most people include a sit to supine position or something equivalent to that to better indicate or uh, find out which side is the involved side. So today we're going to talk about the treatment. I would like to start first uh, by just telling you about the important principles about the treatment of BPPV. You hear many different procedures with uh, sometimes very high levels of uh, uh, success rate, uh, many different names, but there's really no magic to the <clears throat> treatment of BPPV. There's only uh, a, a, a limited uh, options you have in the treatment. First of all, remember that the, uh, because of the geometry of the semicircular canals, and because the cupula is placed in the middle of the canal, there's only one exit path to the particles. And the treatment must involve pushing the particles through that exit path. So now, remember that we can move the neck and the body below that in many different ways. We can move it, twist it, turn it. But ultimately, any of the, and this usually leads to multiple maneuvers that I had talked about, and you have all these different names for these maneuvers. But ultimately, any successful treatment requires that that canal, the involved canal, to be placed in the uh, plane of gravity so that gravity can get a hold of those particles and pull it through the exit path. So. Any of these methods that we'll talk about, that's the pri those two principles are the primary um, principles that we have to remember. There's one other thing that, as a side note here, we often depict the canals in a two-dimensional uh, way. But remember that the 
canals are actually three-dimensional. So, for example, here in this uh, figure, you can see that uh, the uh, the canals, the, the involved canal here is shown in the 2D, but in fact this is a 3D dimensional um, canal, and so it might be what we think is we are moving in the plane of the canal. It might not actually be completely in the plane of the canal. So just remember, if you are involved in this and you're trying to test if this maneuver is working or not, always be prepared to have a three-dimensional um, model of the uh, labyrinth rather than just looking at on paper what happens. Okay, so based on these, we'll start with the treatment. The most common uh, type of uh, BPPV is the posterior canal treatment. So let's uh, <clears throat> talk about the theory of how posterior canal treatment, uh, posterior canal BPPV can be treated. Um, in theory, if you complete the Dix Hallpike maneuver as it's shown in this slide, at the end of the dix pike, once you wait a period of time until the patient's symptoms are gone, the particles will be placed in the lowest end of the canal with respect to gravity. So it's shown here. Now, theoretically, if you want to clear the particles out of the canal, the most uh, logical method would be just simply continue rotating the patient. If you continue rotating the patient 360 degrees and go back to the uh, sitting position, theoretically these particles should gradually move through the canal and um, exit through the available exit path. Now, um, uh, this procedure actually has been tried. Um, and the success rate is uh, more or less the same as the standard Epley maneuver. So the theory of this seems to be solid and it works uh, fine. The only issue with this type of uh, method is that you can't really use, uh, uh, you have to have some sort of uh, chair or table that can rotate 360 degrees. So you need some sort of equipment. So the alternative, the better approach to this would be uh, using the Epley maneuver. Here let's ta uh, see, watch the video. The, the video obviously is uh, sped up so we don't have time for it to show you the full uh, Epley maneuver. This is a left-sided Epley maneuver. We start with the left-sided Dix Hall Pike and the, this is the end of the Dix Hall Pike. Uh, you wait in that uh, uh, point until the patient is completely asymptomatic and then begin turning the head uh, 90 degrees from the <clears throat> end of the Dix Hall Pike to the nose up to the opposite direction. You can do this in a fast uh, step or you can do this in a slow step. Uh, it really does not make much of a difference. In the fast motion the time would be a little shorter, but the patient might be a little bit more symptomatic. You can do this slowly. The patient will have less symptoms, uh, but the, the uh, procedure may take a little longer. At this point, again, you stop for uh, 30 seconds, a minute. Give the patient time to uh, uh, the, until the symptoms are relieved. And then now turn the head another 90 degrees until the nose is down. Uh, 45 degrees downward. Obviously you need to do this uh, with a combination of a, uh, body movement and head movement so you don't put pressure on the patient's neck. This particular position is an important one. You need to wait in this position as long as necessary until the particles clear the, uh, the canal. After the patient is completely asymptomatic, give the patient a minute or two at this position and then bring the patient back up to the sitting position and hang on to the patient for a few uh, minutes, maybe a minute or two until the patient recovers fully. So here's the, <clears throat> the same uh, procedure now. You see it in a form of a, a cartoon characters here and then you see what happens to the canal. As you are going from position B, which is nose up toward the involved side, to the nose down, toward the uh, intact ear, uh, what happens is that the canals will 
rot the, the involved canal would rotate 180 degrees and hopefully the particles would be somewhere in this area and now when gravity pulls these particles they will go right through the <coughs> canal and exit the, <coughs> uh, the canal here. Um, on occasion you might end up when you go from position B to position D. Sometimes these particles might end up on the other side of the canal. In this case the you know, particles would move in the opposite direction and the patients uh, actually will have uh, nystagmus that beats in the opposite direction. If you ever encounter that, this means that the particles go in the wrong way, you need to stop, abort the procedure, bring the patient back up and repeat the procedure. And hopefully this time the particles will be in the, uh, in the correct uh, uh, position. So again, you put the patient back up and wait until um, the patient is completely asymptomatic. I usually ask the patients to sit in the uh, clinic for 5-10 minutes uh, before they leave and then wait another 10-15 minutes in the lobby until they feel completely uh, uh, fine before they, they leave. Uh, I will talk about this briefly but it's worth mentioning here. Uh, in the past we used to give uh, instructions to the patients about not moving the head and maybe sleeping on the, uh, um, not sleeping on the affected side uh, and sleeping upright. There have been several good studies that shown those are not necessary. In um, the last few years uh, we just asked the patient not to move their head very quickly and that was it. We didn't give any more instructions to the patients. So the alternative to for posterior canal treatment is the Samant maneuver or the liberatory maneuver. Uh, so we begin, uh, let's watch the video here, we begin with the head turned away from the involved ear. So again, this is for a left-sided one. Uh, now you bring the patient's head back toward the involved side with the head up 45 degrees. And then again, that position uh, you maintain for a minute or so, and now you uh, bring the patient uh, toward the intact ear with the head orientation uh, uh, the same uh, throughout this movement with respect to the torso. So what you will end up is that with the nose will be downward 45 degrees. If you look at the um, positioning of the head, in the Samant maneuver and the Epley maneuver, they're identical. The only thing that the Samant maneuver does not have is the intermediate step of the uh, head being turned 45 degrees away from the side of the involved uh, canal. So in fact, these procedures are identical as far as the mechanics of them are concerned. It does the same thing as far as the um, movement of the particles. In the Samant maneuver, sometimes you can make the patient move faster from the uh, one side to the other and this has, for that reason, it has been advocated for cupulatiasis. Uh, uh, but in fact, um, uh, it's, you can do the same thing with the Epley maneuver. So given a choice, I usually prefer the Epley maneuver. Uh, we'll talk about the cupulatiasis in a minute, how you might handle cupulatiasis in the, uh, in the posterior canal. So uh, the message would be that the Samant and Epley maneuvers are pretty much uh, identical and the success rates should be uh, roughly the same, which has been in several studies have been shown to be true. Epley maneuver is a little bit easier on the patient. Okay, anterior canal BPPV is fairly uh, or very rare um, <clears throat> and in theory, uh, if you remember this uh, slide from the previous webinar and uh, I will just explain that quickly here, the particles have to be on the opposite side of the cupola. So when you perform the maneuver, the uh, particles first hit against the cupola and then, at least theoretically, they go through the canal and they end up in the lowest portion of the, the canal, which is right about here. Now, in this case, theoretically, if we bring the patient back up, these particles should actually clear the canal. The same thing that we used to do in the 
posterior canal BPPV, turning the patient uh, uh, 360 degrees. We don't have to do that here. If you just bring the patient back up, theoretically, this should clear the, the, uh, the particles. This may be one reason why anterior canal BPPV is uh, so rare, because it might be self-limiting. The patient might actually do this on their own, and they never uh, come to the clinic with the anterior canal BPPV. Now, the treatment methods that have been advocated, uh, initially people said we do the standard Epley maneuver. Uh, it's unlikely to be successful because it doesn't match the pathophysiology. It doesn't allow the particles to go through the exit path that we have. So it's unlikely that the standard Epley maneuver will work. Uh, there, uh, some people have adv advocated reverse Epley maneuver. So instead of the head turning uh, 90 degrees toward the unaffected side, you actually turn the uh, head 90 degrees in the opposite direction. So instead of going in 290 degrees step uh, with the nose up, you go nose down and then you go back to the opposite uh, uh, side, uh, the end of the Epley maneuver. Uh, from a pathophysiology point of view, this seems to be compatible, so it may work and some people have had success with this. The method that has been most successful with anterior canal BPPV is called a deep dix hall pike maneuver. So you begin from the sitting position, but it, you do not turn the head 45 degrees right or left. You have the head straight uh, facing, the patient is face, facing straight ahead. This works for both right and left uh, posterior canal I'm sorry, anterior canal BPPVs. So it has that advantage that you don't really need to know the site. So now you bring the patient back into the laying down position. Some people extend the head maybe 60 degrees. That would be a little dangerous and probably not uh, very good for the patient. So it's best if you have a table or chair that can move and you can put the patient in a position of uh, uh, bending backwards somewhere between 60 and 90 degrees and you hold this position for several minutes and then you some people bring the patient back up completely to position D here some people stop in what is called the standard caloric position with the head is elevated 30 degrees from the supine position um, <clears throat> again um, we don't have much experience with anterior canal BPPV to say which one is better but uh, in general that both methods, whether stopping at position C or just bringing to position D, theoretically should work fine. And again, the advantage of this method is that it will work for both uh, right or left um, anterior canal BPPV. Now, as far as the log roll maneuver for the treatment of the lateral canal BPPV, um, the concept is very similar, uh, both theoretically and uh, practically. You need to begin with the involved ear uh, facing down and from this position you need to turn the patient 360 degrees in the plane of the lateral canal. This should be done in the increments of 30, 90 degrees with the uh, head and body so you don't put uh, too much pressure on the patient's uh, neck. So you see one of the key positions would be in position D where the patient's head should be downward 30 degrees. Now, there are some videos on the internet that show the patient's head elevated, um, just uh, the patient is basically rolling in a bed. Uh, it may work, but the more, more efficient uh, head position would be if the head is tilted downward. So, in many cases, you can actually uh, do not continue with E and F. Instead, at position D, you ask the patient to get on their elbows or to get on their hands and knees with the head bent down uh, 30 degrees. And you maintain that position for, again, a minute or two. This is an important position for lateral canal BPPV, so you maintain that position for a period of time until the particles clear. And then you just bring the patient back up to the uh, sitting position. Because 
this involves rolling in bed uh, much more than the other uh, procedures. It's best if this is performed on the floor, so there's no chance that the patient can uh, fall off the table. Now, there are alternative methods for uh, treatment of lat lateral canal, BPPV. The reason for that is the success rate for the treatment of lateral canal is much lower. Um, uh, the posterior canal, compared to the posterior canal, which is the success rate is 90 percent, uh, lateral canal success rate is somewhere between 50 to 70 percent. One of the reasons might be that uh, we cannot uh, identify the site of the BPPV as easily as we can do in the posterior canal. So there are alternative methods, for example, Gafani maneuver, have been proposed with uh, a lot of success uh, rate. But in, in theory, if we go back to the very first slide that I talked about treatment, there's no magic. You have to put the canal in the plane of gravity and you have to make sure that the particles will go through the exit, uh, exit path. And in the Gefani procedure, at least in one of them, uh, that seems to be the case. In the other one, the, for uh, ageotropic versus geotropic, for the uh, geotropic one, it seems to be the uh, would place the particles in the um, in the path to exit, but the other one is not quite clear. At any rate, most of these procedures shorten the time, but in principle, if the uh, barbecue roll doesn't work, the other ones uh, probably will not work either. Now, the Gafani procedure as far as the procedure itself is concerned. It is simple, so you can try that if you want to. Uh, the, another procedure that has been reported with a high success rate is the forced prolonged positioning for uh, lateral canal BPPV. In this case, the patient is instructed to sleep on one side the whole night, or at least six hours or so. Typically, the patient is told to sleep on the unaffected side. Um, and this is supposed to uh, release the particles over time and move them out of the, the canal. Uh, gravity can move them out of the canal. Uh, but in many cases, if it's not successful, then you can attempt uh, having the patient sleep on the, the supposed affected site. Uh, uh, so uh, for one or two nights, you can have the patient sleep on one side and then one or two nights sleep on the other side. There are single, uh, the procedures that we have talked about are single treatment procedures. There have been before the, um, uh, before the um, Epley and Simant maneuvers became popular, there were home exercises, uh, mainly uh, Brandt Daroff exercises that uh, patients were sent home by uh, with the set, set of instructions. Uh, in general, these should be res reserved only if, as a supplement or if the uh, standard methods are not successful. Um, the initial theory was that the home exercises are habituating the, the, the patient. Uh, it's, it's a part of the compensation. But in fact, that's probably not true. It, in fact, what we were doing was inefficient uh, Please. And if you make an inefficient procedure several times, which that's what it was done with the Brandt Daroff exercises, if you do it inefficiently but you do it multiple times, eventually um, uh, you will clear the particles. So if you are going to send patient home with exercises, uh, I personally prefer to give them exercises that simulate Epley maneuver rather than the uh, Brandt Daroff exercises. But remember, home exercises should really never be given as a first option. Uh, we only do, did this uh, uh, if the, uh, the, the case was a clear-cut BPPV, we've ruled out everything else, and if we have treated the patient successfully in the, in the office, and then if it recurred, then we gave them uh, home exercises, but otherwise, uh, it, uh, because the BPPV can be mistaken uh, with some other causes, uh, more serious causes, uh, we should always try to make sure that we're dealing with an absolute uh, case of BPPV and not something else. 
uh, a few considerations about the cupulothiasis. Cupulothiasis, you have to first convert it to canalithiasis before uh, you can start the treatment. Uh, and the best method uh, would be to use some sort of vibration before and during the maneuvers. So, for example, if I suspected the patient had a uh, posterior canal um, uh, cupulothiasis, uh, I will vibrate the mastoid bone on the affected side for uh, about a minute or so before I initiate the, the uh, Dixal pike followed by the Epley procedure. And then throughout the procedure, I will keep vibrating the uh, the affected side. The hope is that this vibration will um, separate the particles from the cupula and would allow you to, um, uh, to actually clear the particles out of the, um, out of the canal. Uh, there have been several good studies that show um, vibration not to make much of a difference in the success rate. But remember those studies probably involved mostly canalithiasis patients. That's what you have. 95% of the patients have canalithiasis. In the case of canalithiasis, vibration uh, is not uh, absolutely necessary. On occasions, you run into cases where the particles jam the canal, and in those cases, vibration might help. But sometimes, shaking the head will get the particles loose also. Um, as I mentioned before, most of the studies that have been done with post-therapy instructions, they show that it's not really needed. Uh, and the only thing we tell the patients is that to avoid vigorous head movements for about 24 hours or so. And finally, if you have cases of bilateral BPPV, uh, the procedure is that you treat first for the, the side that produces stronger responses. Uh, Many cases when the patient returns to for evaluation of the success, uh, the cases that were assumed to be bilateral BPPV, you will see that after the treatment for one side, it's actually both sides are treated. These are the cases of false positive bilateral BPPVs where one canal has produced responses in both the uh, and in this case, uh, then you don't need to do anything. If the patient returns and uh, you notice that uh, there's still uh, symptoms and responses for the other side, now that you uh, you treat for the uh, for the involved side. Um, by the way, uh, the typical procedure is after you treat the patient, you need to bring the patient back within one week or so to make sure that the the method has been success uh, the the treatment has been successful. And the success of the treatment should involve negative uh, uh, provocative maneuver, whether it's Dixal Pike sideline or uh, roll maneuver, and the patient telling you that the symptoms are relieved. Uh, complications of the, uh, of the uh, BPPV. Occasionally when you're, for example, treating for the posterior canal BPPV, you may uh, move the particles from one canal to another. Typically, that's from posterior to the lateral canal. If that happens, then you treat for the new type of BPPV. The patient might have neck stiffness and muscle spasms during the procedure. If that's happening, you have the patient uh, have them uh, take uh, anti uh, the, the muscle relaxants or um, before the procedure so this doesn't happen. Uh, taking medications before the, uh, this maneuver is okay because you're not really um, uh, diagnosing it this time, you're, you're treating. Same thing if the patient is uh, suffering from severe vertigo and nausea during the procedure, give them some anti-vertigo medications before you uh, uh, treat. And finally, some patients have a drop attack during the um, the maneuver, um, uh, which uh, or after the maneuver, that's because the particles are shearing uh, toward the uh, saccule and causing uh, the patient to feel like they're being pulled down. So, as I said, hold on to the patient for a while before you let them go, so that the patient doesn't fall off the table. Uh, and the message is, if your treatment is like, successful after two tries then your full workup is necessary. That includes imaging studies and so forth. Uh, I will hand the microphone to my colleague, uh, 
uh, Wendy, who will continue from uh, from here on. Okay, so we are going to talk about the ICS impulse now and how it relates to BPPV treatment. Um, a lot of this, if you saw the BPV assessment, um, some of this will be familiar to you as well because the same benefits you get from the assessment you also get during treatment. So the ICS impulse can assist you in a couple of different ways. One, it's a very light weight goggle. So obviously moving the person around in these different positions is a lot easier than a larger, heavier goggle. So the goggle will actually stay on the patient's head. You can do this vision or vision denied. You have the real-time slow phase velocity. So as Dr. Barine said, when you move the person into the first position, you don't want to move them into the next position until the nystagmus has subsided. And you will see this on the screen. And if you have a large external monitor, not only will you see the eye, you'll also see a real-time slow phase velocity. We're going to talk about head position feedback. Just like in treatment, we have head position feedback for the repositioning as well. And then at the end, you have synchronized playback. So you'll see the eye trace, the SPV um, graph, the eye video, and the head position feedback, or the synchronized room video, depending on which one you choose. Um, so you can play everything back and look at the uh, treatment as well. And a lot of people like this playback because it helps them um, counsel the patient and helps the patient understand what's happening to them and why the treatment was performed. So like I said on the real-time uh, slow phase velocity, if you see here on the big uh, external monitor, there's a green number three. Um, that's not very much uh, slow phase velocity, but that's the, where the number would be that um, would show you the real-time slow phase velocity as you're treating the patient. Um, what's not shown on this uh, picture but is in the software is the uh, elapsed time. So you'll also have the elapsed time on the external monitor as well. And all of this is also on your um, computer. So what's nice about the external monitor is obviously it makes it very easy to see the patient eye, the real-time SPV, and the elapsed time. So the first, um, we're going to go through three of the um, repositioning. In our software, they're labeled CRT for canalith repositioning treatment or sometimes called canalith repositioning procedure. Um, you can go into software. If you want to call it EPLI, um, then you can actually go in the software and rename it so that it shows up on if you're doing a report or something like that and you want to say this was the EPLI maneuver, um, you can rename it to EPLI. Same thing with uh, laboratory. You can change it to Samant. And then barbecue roll and log roll, those are synonyms. Um, and I believe that it's sometimes called the Limpert uh, maneuver as well. So, but you can go in and change um, the names if you want to use um, the developers or the researchers' name who came up with that maneuver. The other thing is, is if you're using a maneuver like a phony um, and it's not in the software, you can always change one of the three that's in there and make it go phony. Now, what you won't have is the head position feedback that I'm going to show you, but then you choose to use the room video and you'll still see the patient's head and how it's being moved um, during, and it'll coordinate, um, it'll all be played back synchronously with the eye movement as well. So if you choose to use something other than Epley Cement or the barbecue roll, um, you can do so. So these videos I'm going to show you of how the head position feedback work they go through quite quickly, and that's just to save time. But remember that you should remain in each position until nystagmus subsides, um, and then move to the next position. So we're going to first play, uh, play CRT, or the Epley Maneuver. So, oops, let me go back. Let's see, can we get this to play? There we go. So they're going to move 45 degrees. Um, to the left, and you can see the canals you're treating are highlighted in green. One thing you want to keep reminding the person, if you look in this video, um, is to keep their eyes wide open. So then we went, did the traditional Dix Hall Pike, went over to the other side, and now we're going to go down with the nose down. But you got to remind them to keep their eyes wide open so you can track that eye. And now we're sitting back up. So that was obviously when you do the test or we'll do the treatment, it's a lot slower than that, and you stop at each position. The next one is the laboratory. So this is the, um, the one where you're moving over from one side and then completely over to the other side, or the Samant maneuver. So again, we turn the head 45 degrees, 
then we lay them over on the side so they're going around and down and then they're going to go all the way over to the other side and again they should be keeping their eye um, nice and wide open okay and then you sit them back up and then the last one is the log roll or barbecue roll and you know you notice this has several different steps in this block here this is the top line is 55 degrees the bottom line is 90 degrees you want it just like the roll maneuver in um, assessment you want to make sure that you turn the head as far as it'll go but you need to be within that 55 to 90 degree area um, some people's neck is stiff and you can't get them all the 90 degree the farther the better so we'll play this so we go to the unaffected side then we come over to the affected side and now this is where Cameron had mentioned um, that some people are now recommending that you stop let me pause this real quick that instead of let me just go back a little okay that you stop between one and two with the nose facing up. So you start on the unaffected side. Instead of going 180 degrees to the affected side, you may want to stop at 90 degrees with the nose up. And remember, the head should be tilted 30 degrees. Okay, so then we rotate around. So now we're with the nose facing towards the ground, but they're not completely. Now at this point, let me just pause this and move back just a little. Okay, hold on just a second. So at step number four, that is at the point where uh, Dr. Barine mentioned that um, you might have the person up on their uh, elbows or up on their um, hands and knees because their head is facing directly towards the ground. And then you're rotating them all the way around to step five and then back to the starting position. So what the head position feedback does is it guides you to make sure you're positioning the person correctly. And again, you stop at each step. You're watching your real-time SPV, watching your eye movement. Um, and even though we have the pupil location on this video right here, the grayscale will always show on your external monitor. Um, and you can choose to show the grayscale image on the um, laptop or on the computer as well. Um, but so you stop in each one of the positions, wait till the nystagmus subsides, and then move to the next position. So the head position feedback is a guide to make sure you're positioning the person properly, and it also shows you which canals you're treating. Um, you can also learn a lot more about ICS Impulse on icsimpulse.com, um, and there's lots of videos um, there, and it shows you how the software works. Headimpulse.com is um, where um, a lot of the research behind Head Impulse um, was done and then odometrics.com also is a good resource and there's um, if you uh, enjoy listening to Dr. Breen as I do there's a lot of videos on odometrics.com and on icsimpulse.com that cover other topics as well of his so I believe we're going to take some questions now um, does anybody have any questions so you type your questions in So it doesn't look like we have any questions right now. Um, Dr. Breen, is there anything else that you would like to add? Well, I think the, the main message here is that uh, uh, we discussed this a little bit last time, and I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, a lot of times the cupular thiasis uh, of the, well, the posterior lateral canal, uh, it's caused by something um, other than uh, cupular thiasis. So uh, we discussed how to treat cupular thiasis in the case of, uh, uh, for example, posterior canal, you vibrate the mastoid bone, or in the case of lateral canal, you do the same thing on the affected side. But if the treatment is not successful with the cupular thiasis, uh, generally it's best if you, uh, uh, if you consider other uh, causes too. Uh, for example, last time we discussed about the concept of heavy cupula, light uh, endolymph, and so forth. And theoretically, that's possible, although nobody has really shown this uh, 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 in, in a research, uh, in a well-done research project. But 
theoretically it's possible. So in those cases, uh, the symptoms would be very similar to uh, to BPPV, but the repositioning maneuvers will not work. And in that case, uh, you should always uh, look for other ca other causes. And the general rule is, after two retries, if you're not successful with the with the repositioning maneuver, then um, you need to get a full workup. Sometimes we receive a question, so what do you do for a person who is uh, who has that kind of a, a, a BPPV or supposed BPPV? It's, sometimes it's called intractable BPPV. What do you do with that? Well, um, the, really the only option for that would be canal occlusion, which involves surgery of plugging the canal. It does treat the symptoms, but also disables the canal, so you have to remember that. Well, if there are no other questions, I'll just turn it again to Wendy and Andres for any other comments. Uh, uh, yes, we actually just did get one more question here. Um, I'll uh, post a question here and, f and let one of you answer this. Do you also consider using uh, Apiani and Kasani treatment maneuvers for lateral canal involvement? Uh, when did you want me to take this? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I personally, I will always, for lateral canal BPPV, I will always start with barbecue roll. Uh, because I'm familiar with this. And most of these procedures, what, what, whatever procedure you're comfortable with and you, are, um, you have practice with it, and as long as you keep that principle, that physiologically, yes, you do put the canal in the plane of gravity and you do allow the particles to exit. Uh, so you need to know a little bit about the physiology of each of these maneuvers, where the head is positioned, how it gets from one position to another position. If you consider that any of the procedures, uh, they're fine. I do uh, consider uh, Kasani and Apiani maneuvers, uh, but, but mostly with lateral canal. I would stick with the barbecue roll, and on a few occasions I've tried the Gafani maneuver too. As I said, theoretically they all should work, um, and if you're not successful with one, you can try another one. If you're more comfortable with one, just do that one. All right, one more. Do you use a head shake when in phase two of a Simon maneuver? Yeah, sometimes people use a, a, just a shaking the head back and forth, and th this serves two purposes. Uh, you can do this either as a part of Samant maneuver or actually part of Epley maneuver as, as well. Epley's original description of the maneuver always requires, uh, he, he says you have to have vibration. And his rationale for that is that these particles are actually quite large compared to the size of the canal in certain areas. So his rationale is that when the particles are moving through the canal, they could get jammed and uh, not move. And the, the, the uh, vibration would allow, uh, make them smaller and loosen the particles and allow that to move through the canal. The head shake is actually for the exact same purpose, uh, so to so prevent any kind of uh, canal jamming. Uh, and if you think that that's ha what's happening, uh, the, usually the sign of the canal jamming is this: the patient suddenly has a very strong, uh, very strong nystagmus that really doesn't go away like the BPPV type, and it happens right during, during the maneuver. When you're moving the head from one position to another, the patient becomes really severely symptomatic and you have this uh, very strong nystagmus. Alternatively, the nystagmus that was coming along with the moderate velocity then suddenly stops. These are the two signs of uh, canal jamming, and in this case, yes, if I ever notice that, I just shake the head a little bit uh, to loosen the particles. Okay. And next one, uh, what is recommended maneuver for anterior canal BPPV? Uh, Jacobino maneuver? 
I'm not familiar with that maneuver. If that's the, it's probably one of the maneuvers that I mentioned. If it's the deep dix hall pike, that's the one currently most people think is the deep dix hall pike is the is the recommended procedure for anterior canal BPPV. I'm not familiar with the other, with that one. If you, uh, if the person who's asking the question, if they can describe it, then we can go through the head movement and see if uh, uh, if that will be effective. Okay. That's, uh, we just have one more here. Uh, what do you see? So the description here, I think, is uh, deep head hanging, then bring pa patient to setting position. Yeah, that's the deep dix hall pike. That's the maneuver I just mentioned. Uh, that's, that's one of the slides. Uh, it, it, it's actually, it, the initial phase of it looks like a dix hall pike, except that the head is not turned uh, 45 degrees. Its head is straight. The patient is uh, brought back with an angle uh, of quite large angle, something between 60 to 90 degrees, held in that position for a minute or two, and then brought back up to the sitting position. Uh, the people here, we, we usually refer to that as deep dix hall pike. And yes, that is the recommended procedure currently for the, for the anterior canal BPPV. All right, thanks. And then the next one, we have a question from Dominican Republic. Uh, uh, I want to know what you do when uh, the cement uh, maneuver doesn't work. Well, in any of these maneuvers, if you perform the maneuver uh, after twice and the, uh, the patient uh, is not successful, if, you, if you're not successful, successfully treating the patient with those maneuvers. The next step is to do a full workup, which means you get um, MRIs, you get uh, uh, full vestibular testing to rule out other causes. Uh, so, for example, it could be that the patient has a uh, unilateral vestibular loss and it's being mistaken for BPPV. Or it's possible that, uh, for example, the patient has a uh, the superior portion of the vestibular nerve in the acute stages you have seen torsional nystagmus and that might have been mistaken for uh, BPPV. So you rule out other causes um, or it might be a central lesion for example. Once you rule out the central causes then if the patient is still symptomatic now you have uh, the dilemma that the patient seems to have a true BPPV but uh, you're, you're procedures have not been successful. In this case, it's worthwhile trying something like a, uh, uh, like the take-home uh, exercises, like the Brandt Aroff exercises, or some modification of those um, airplane maneuvers so the patient can do this at home. So you send the patient home with what used to be called habituation exercises. and after like one or two weeks see how successful it is. Ultimately, if none of these are successful, as I mentioned, the canal occlusion surgery is the only option left. Okay, we have uh, one more question here. Um, might be for you, Wendy. Do you recommend this new system to replace VNG uh, when BPPV is highly suggested by history? So the ICS impulse, um, it depends on your clinic as far as if you would think the ICS impulse would replace uh, VNG. Obviously the ICS impulse um, works well for BPVV assessment and treatment and um, I will pose a question to uh, Dr. Barine in just a second regarding uh, when bilateral recording is needed. So the ICS impulse is only monocular. Um, but as far as replacing a full VNG, if you, your clinic sees patients that um, have multiple sclerosis, disconjugate eye movement, you still need binocular recording and you still need a full saccade smooth pursuit um, type test 
So I don't believe that ICS Impulse is a complete replacement for VNG. But for the BPBV patients, um, Dr. Breen, maybe you can um, answer that question. Uh, yes, uh, Wendy is completely correct. I think, uh, and the question relates to um, replacing VNG uh, uh, for BPPV patients. Remember, again, from the last uh, uh, webinar, the recommended procedure for the BPPV patient is this. If the patient has a strong history of BPPV, then you do not need to do VNG. So in that case, yes, this is a replacement for VNG. So what you do is you do a hall pike, and a Dix hall pike. If it's positive, you just go to treatment. You don't need to do full VNG for these patients. Now, if the Dix hall pike is negative, then you do a roll maneuver. If the roll maneuver is positive, then you do uh, treatment for lateral canal BPPV. If those two are negative, then now you don't have any evidence for BPPV. Now you need to do uh, full vestibular testing, which in that case you still need to do VNG. So uh, in a sense with a patient with a clear-cut history of BPPV, yes, this could be used as the first uh, uh, line of testing. Uh, if it turns out that you still need a full uh, vestibular testing, then you need to do the VNG. Uh, regarding the whether it's binocular or uh, uh, monocular recording, in the case of BPVV, it doesn't really make much difference. Monocular recording is more than adequate for BPPV. Okay, so. Uh... Last question here, uh, if it is central, what are the recommendations? Well, I think that we have to first find out what the underlying central uh, cause is. Uh, there are many of these cases, uh, once the central cause is identified uh, properly, then each one of them has a, has a, a recommended uh, uh, treatment procedure. It's definitely not repositioning maneuver anymore, uh, but it really depends on what the cause is. BPPV type symptoms have been reported in MS patients, in migraine patients, in uh, stroke patients, uh, and many other types of uh, central abnormalities. So the, the uh, treatment would be first identifying what the cause is, and that definitely will not be done by um, Hall Pike. It has to be done with uh, additional testing and full workup. All right. That was it. Um, yeah. If there are no further questions, we will end today's uh, webinar. Um, after we end, there will be a short feedback form that we would appreciate if you take the time to, to complete. Um, other than that, thanks for this time and uh, stay tuned on autometrics.com slash webinars where we will keep you informed about future webinars.